Um, great. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, I'm really excited to be part of the Genomic Social Hour. And uh, yes, so my name is Chloe Orlin. I'm a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz in Beth Shapiro's lab. And I'm going to tell you today a little bit more about our efforts to recover the critically endangered uh, black abalone using environmental genomics. So, oh, no, there we go. So first of all, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about who the black abalone is. So there are seven species of abalone that are found in California's waters. And the black abalone can be found uh, from the Monterey Bay to Baja California. They're marine gastropods that can live up to 30 years. They become sexually mature after seven years and they feed on kelp, um, feather boa kelp, bull kelp, um, um, depending on, on where you find them along the coast. They live on rocky substrates in intertidal and um, um, shallow subtidal reefs, usually at the maximum of 18 foot deep. Um, and they tend to occur in habitats with complex surfaces, deep crevices that provide shelter for both juveniles and adults. Um, and so they used to be found in abundance. As you can see in the photo in the top right corner, that's taken in Santa Barbara at the start of the 20th century. Um, and you can also see in this figure in the bottom right, that's a newspaper clipping actually, um, that abalone landings were huge. Um, in 1916, you have just under 1 million pounds. About 10 years later, in 1928, you're up to 3 million pounds of abalone uh, brought back from fishing. And so they were found really in, in high, high abundances. Um, and this isn't even the peak of the, of the fisheries. The fisheries peaked in the 1970s. But as you can imagine, they've been overfished since the 1850s. And so by 1990, um, the landings had plummeted to basically zero. So in 1993, uh, black abalone fishing became illegal, although um, there was still some poaching due to the, the high value of their meat. Um, and um, just uh, so you know, the red abalone was actually still allowed to be recreationally fished up until 2018. But um, since then, it's been completely illegal to fish the red abalone too. So no abalone species can be fished currently recreationally or commercially uh, along the Californian coast. And um, on top of the overfishing, the abalone were decimated by a disease called the withering syndrome. And it's caused by a bacteria called the withering syndrome rickettsia like organism um, that prevents the abalone from producing digestive enzymes. <clears throat> and it's really nasty. They essentially end up starving. Um, it was discovered first in the 1980s when fishermen were seeing very poor looking abalone along the coast and a lot of empty shells. And it's led up to 99% declines in some areas. So um, the, the, what's, what's interesting is that over the last 10, 15 years, um, some populations seem to be recovering from the disease. And uh, a phage that attacks, the bacteria that attacks the abalone has been discovered and might be explaining some of these uh, recoveries. Um, all this to say the black abalone has been on the IUCN critically endangered list since 2003 and on the US um, Endangered Species Act since 2009. The white abalone was actually the first invertebrate to ever be placed on the US Endangered Species Act in 2001. But the thing about the white abalone is that um, there's uh, been a lot of research done, especially at the Bodega Marine Lab, uh, where they actually managed to captively breed them. Um, it's incredible work. And uh, they've released them into the oceans uh, just about two years ago, I think, or a year and a half ago. Um, but this isn't possible for the black abalone as we still don't know how to captively breed them. So um, these kind of recovery programs are not currently an option. What we're thinking of doing though, is relocating some of the healthy individuals um, into the more unhealthy populations and trying to get the, pop the, the populations to, to grow again that way. Um, 
but to do this, we need to understand the genetic diversity uh, of these populations. So abalone, black abalone are broadcast spawners. Um, however, they have large negatively buoyant gametes that tend to sink to the bottom of the ocean close to the parent. Um, they have short larval periods of just a few days and short breeding seasons that limit their dispersal. And you can see in this figure that was just a buoy uh, being uh, drifting uh, in panel A in the winter and in panel B in the summer. And you can see how depending on when the breeding season occurs, it can really limit the dispersal. And so we believe that the black abalone uh, are likely to have structured populations um, and that could complicate their relocation. And there's been not that many studies that have looked at this. There was one done 15, 20 years ago that showed that the um, mainland populations um, and the island populations were genetically different and that adults and juveniles were too, but it was done on a small scale and not really um, across their range. And obviously we need to know this if we're gonna start bringing in some organisms from one population to another, uh, you don't wanna be bringing in some recessive mutations or susceptibility to the disease or just create more inbreeding and actually uh, create more harm than uh, benefit for, for this endangered species. So um, before I tell you a little bit more about the work we're doing, um, I wanna stress the importance of abalone. You might feel like they're just a seashell, there's other ones, um, but they really do have um, a strong cultural, economical and ecological importance in California. Um, culturally, they are part of um, the Native American tribes traditions um, also part of their sustainable sustenance and the uh, abalone shell are used for a lot of jewelry and ornaments and are really part of their stories. Um, economically, they've been traded uh, for to, to Asian markets mainly as a food resource. Um, they're also part of the history of California with Japanese and Chinese fishermen coming to California for this um, abalone fishing industry. Um, and ecologically, uh, abalone tend to be uh, bottom feeders that attach to the rock. And so when they're gone, the purple sea urchin can really take over um, the seafloor. And uh, they've been decimating the kelp forest because uh, they're really good grazers. So without the abalone, there's more urchin, less kelp. And similarly, you have a top-down effect where um, the sea otters are affected. So the sea otters eat um, abalone as one of their resources. And sure, there's other um, resources available like clams and mussels, but those are, tend to be filter feeders that accumulate more toxins and pathogens and parasites and have probably actually contributed to uh, the spread of certain diseases in uh, the sea otter populations. So in the end, the abalone is, is probably a healthier food resource for them. So um, I hope I've convinced you that um, it's important to conserve black abalone. And the way we're approaching this is uh, firstly by assembling a high quality reference genome. And that will be used to assess uh, the population structure of the abalone, the black abalone across California. Um, there is a third project that I'm not going to cover today, which involves detecting the presence of abalone using environmental DNA. It's also a genomics project, so I thought I'd mention it. Um, and a little pilot project was done on that, and I'm happy to answer more questions after. But I'll focus on the population structure work today. And um, so um, there are, we're trying to figure out which scenario might be underlying the, the patterns observed uh, in genetic diversity. And it might be a single one of those or a combination of those scenarios. So um, could be um, withering syndrome induced bottlenecks, um, the physiology or life history might limit the gamete dispersal of black abalone and ocean currents might also affect the gamete or larval flow. And, um, we're also hoping to identify some critical habitats where the populations might be more diverse um, and or less affected by the withering syndrome. So um, to do this, the first step was the genome assembly. Um, and I'd like to thank the Earth Biogenome Project and the California Conservation mm -hmm. Genomics Project, the CCGP, for uh, making that possible. So we used um, 
three smart cells got 38x coverage uh, of their one gigabyte genome. So we're very happy with that. Um, I'll just run through this quickly, but um, the, it, it was um, a little hard to extract high molecular weight uh, DNA from the, the abalone. Mollusks are known to be difficult to, to do that, those extractions on, but in the end, and thanks to the uh, wonderful team of people uh, that are on this slide, we managed to um, get high quality DNA, um, even get their mitogenome sequenced and um, obtain um, a, a good, uh, a high quality reference genome. So you can see here, there's about a 1.5% heterozygosity, uh, which is actually pretty high. Um, and then in terms of general stats, uh, low number of sequences, a good uh, value for the N50, a high BUSCO score of 97%. So um, I'm really grateful to um, the, the people on this slide who, who made this possible, Blythe, Ruta, On, and Merle. Um, and so with this um, reference genome, um, we, I'll move on to the population structure analysis. So the, the thing about the black abalone, as I said, is they're critically endangered. So getting permits to work on them is really complicated and takes a long time. And they're also hemophiliac. So removing them from the rock can cause them to uh, bleed and even to die. And so you don't want to, by doing field work, actually uh, have a counter um, uh, effect and actually cause more damage again than you'd want to. So um, with the help of Josh Kapp at UCSC, I developed a semi-invasive non-lethal swabbing method. And um, in this video and photo, these are uh, farmed red abalone from a farm near Santa Cruz. And we tried out the method on, on these first and saw that we could recover about 25 to 50% endogenous DNA um, from those swabs. So it was quite promising. And um, that's how we went forward with the um, sampling of abalone along the California coastline, this time wild black abalone. Um, and you can see that we know kind of which populations are um, affected by the withering syndrome or not. And so um, the ones at the south are. And the plan, um, we've been able to do this um, with Pete Raimondi's team of a uh, field team that has been doing with the Marine and Peace Corps programs, uh, long-term monit coastal monitoring over the last few years. And so I just gave them my swabbing kits and they were able to go collect samples for me. I got to go, um, a few times, not many. This photo is actually from the latest uh, sequence, uh, la latest field run uh, that was uh, closer to Santa Cruz and it was really beautiful. Um, but they've done incredible work getting all those samples back. And so uh, the idea is to then extract the DNA from the swabs and get 10x coverage of whole genome resequencing. Um, another little point about this is uh, you may have heard recently of the um, Big Sur landslide that happened, you may have seen photos of the one where, where um, it's, it's actually a section of it has disappeared now that was happened in January. And uh, through this event, a lot of the Black Abalone were put in danger. Um, unfortunately, some died, but that meant that I uh, obtained some tissue samples that could be used for some transcriptomics work in the future. So through this tragedy, we're obtaining some samples that will hopefully be useful uh, in helping their restoration. So that's been a bit of a, a, a kind of change of plans that just happened recently. And we also got uh, more samples uh, that way from certain sites. Um, and so really briefly, I will run you through um, the methods of this work and where we're at. So uh, the sample collection has been completed. Um, the DNA extraction has been completed on all the swabs uh, that we wanted to use. Um, and so I've just been working on optimizing the library prep protocol. Uh, I'll be using a ligation based approach. And uh, I've been doing a lot of those and now I'm, I'm happy with what we have. We're obtaining actually pretty high um, percentages of endogenous content from 66 to 76% in those 
uh, three example samples, but uh, yes, I've done quite a few libraries now. And so we're just about to scale up to get them all done. The quality check is looking good. And so the next uh, step will be to use those um, for high coverage sequencing on a NovaSeq. Then I'll carry on with the data processing and the data analysis. And um, so to wrap up, um, future plans include improving the genome assembly. We're actually also doing chromosome level scaffolding using OmniSea. And that work uh, is actually just happening right now and should be done hopefully in the next uh, week or two. So that'll make the, the reference genome even uh, better. We'll get genome annotation and RNA-seq data, as I said, through the transcriptomics work. Um, we are, uh, and then I'll carry on with the population structure assessment. So carry on uh, preparing libraries, sequencing and data processing to eventually determine gen genotype likelihoods and constructed mixture plots. Uh, there is also a plan to collect samples from Baja California. If we get the funding to do so, we have a team of collaborators there. Um, and uh, in the end, more generally, the idea is to use the rest of the CCGP data to inform management of the Black Abalone and the entire coastal kelp forest ecosystem. And I'm stressing that point because through the CCGP, we're going to get um, information data on the giant kelp, the bull kelp, the sea otters, the red abalone, and the purple sea urchin, which are all um, key actors in the coastal kelp forest ecosystem. So I think we'll have a lot of very important data um, from this work. And um, yes, yeah, so thank you for listening. And thanks to all the people listed here, in particular, my PI Beth Shapiro and Pete Ramondi, who is also leading this project. Uh, thanks to Nate Fletcher, Fletcher and his team, who's done all the field work, and to the UC Davis Sequencing Corps for uh, helping with the uh, reference genome. And thanks to all the funders without who the, the research wouldn't be possible. So yes, I'll take any questions. There we go. I think I'm in now. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And um, I realized it was about a year ago that we went into COVID shutdown and Athena set this up and it's pretty much saved me. I love coming to all these seminars and I really enjoyed your talk, Chloe. So thanks. Um, so I wanted to talk today a little bit about work that folks in my lab have been doing um, on barred and spotted owls in California. And, um, and I should say that all this work is being done by, by um, students and, and postdocs working in my lab and, and with collaborator Jeff Wall. And I'll try and acknowledge all of them at the end and, and talk about their work where I can. If, I'll try not to forget. Um, but this is the spotted owl. Um, and it's a medium-sized forest owl. Um, and it, it's, it occurs in the Western United States. There are three subspecies of spotted owl. The northern spotted owl, which ranges um, from, let's see, I can't seem to get my, uh, my, my pointer here, but um, from British Columbia through Washington, Oregon, and down the coast of California. And then it's replaced by the California spotted owl around the Pitt River in Northern California and down the Sierras to Southern California and back up the coast to around Monterey. And there's a third subspecies, the Mexican spotted owl, um, which is found in the sky islands of the desert Southwest and into Mexico. Um, the, the Northern spotted owl, the northernmost subspecies of spotted owl is, um, was listed in 1990 under the Endangered Species Act as threatened. Um, and its listing was one of the most economically impactful of any US Endangered Species Act listing. So it's been something that's been under a lot of criticism and been highly watched. And, and because of that, these birds have been very highly studied as well. The decline was due primarily to the loss of critical nesting habitat, which is old growth forest because they need old growth for their nesting core, their, their central, their, their nesting area. Um, but about a decade or 20 years ago, it was also realized that Another species, the barred owl, has been invading the Western United States and they realize that this is a potential threat. So the barred owl is a close relative of the uh, Northern spotted owl and it's about 10% divergent in mitochondrial DNA protein coding genes and about 0.7% across the entire nuclear genome. They're slightly larger than Northern spotted owls. They're more aggressive. They're more generalists in terms of their habitat preference and as, and as well as their diet. So they tend to do well in areas that spotted owls don't do as well in, including the forests of the Northwest that have been 
um, over harvested for timber and damaged in, in other ways. Um, now, interestingly, the barred owl is actually native to the Eastern United States. And um, the map here on the left is taken from the field guide that I grew up with um, from 1983. And the, the barred owls were traditionally believed to have occurred in the Eastern United States only. And they were mostly held over there by the lack of forested habitat in the Great Plains states. Um, <laughs> But in, in recent years, they've been moving northward, um, probably due to climate change and also westward, um, partially due to habitat alterations that humans have, have made. And so by, by 1983, you can see that they ranged all the way um, up into the forests of the boreal forests of Southern Canada and moved westward. And the map on the right is from a 2000, a nine, a 2000 um, account from Birds of North America showing that the barred owls had already invaded Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. And if we look at um, eBird data, which is citizen science data, you can see that um, the most recent records are all the way down into um, uh, San Mateo County and as far south as Santa Barbara in the, in the Sierra Nevada. So they've, they've made it quite a ways down. And it's not just a matter of them expanding their ranges, but throughout most of their Western range, the populations are growing exponentially. So this is Northern California and the California Oregon borders right on the top of this image. But you can see these are all detections of barred owls from a couple of different databases. And what you can see here is that um, at this point, the barred owls are actually um, outnumbering spotted owls in uh, Del Norte County, Humboldt County, and in parts of Mendocino County. And we believe that that's probably going to be the case soon in places like Sonoma and in um, Marin County if we don't do something about it. And so this is a, a great conservation concern that, that a lot of folks are paying attention to and trying to figure out um, what to do about it. And in, in addition to the things that I've already mentioned, um, the spotted owls also interbreed with barred owls and a number of hybrids have been found in the wild. And here's a couple of pictures. They call these things sparred owls and they have a very weird call that's halfway in between a spotted owl and a barred owl. And, um, and the folks who work in the field and, and um, observe their nesting say that it's mostly mating pairs that involve a female barred owl with a male spotted owl. And that these, these pairings tend to occur where um, barred owls are still relatively rare and potentially having a hard time finding conspecific mates. And so they may be mating with, um, with uh, spotted owls in some of these areas. And the numbers of barred owl, spotted owl hybrids can be quite high in areas that the barred owl has recently invaded. So for example, in the Northern Sierras, um, as much as 30% of the non-spotted owl Strix owls, so that would be hybrids plus barred owls, about 30% of those are believed to be hybrids. Um, now, there are also a number of important studies being done where, where barred owls are being removed from the Western United States in order to study how barred owls are impacting spotted owls. And museums like ours are getting many of these specimens. And so we're trying to, to do as much work as we can on them. And when we get these things in, we notice that these Western barred owls look very different from Eastern barred owls. So for reference here, the top image is an Eastern barred owl, a very typical phenotype that you see from the Eastern United States. The Southern one is a Northern spotted owl. And again, this is a very typical phenotype that you see from the Western United States, the Northern spotted owl. The middle one is a Western spotted owl. And this is a very typical phenotype that you find in Siskiyou County. In fact, most of the birds there look something like this. And you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at these things and say, wow, there's something going on in the Western United States because these barred owls don't look the same as their ancestral populations in the East. In fact, they're kind of intermediate in size. Um, the, the barring that you find or the vertical stripes that you find on the belly are replaced by something akin to spots. And even the color is very different from the Eastern um, barred owl. It's more of a dark chocolate brown than a milk chocolate brown than you find in the Eastern barred owls. And so I became really interested in this system. Um, and I thought that it, it would be a really interesting study system for a variety of reasons. One is that um, we could do some really interesting studies of invasion dynamics because the invasion is still underway and it's still progressing. There are areas that the barred owls have been for a long amount of time and areas that they've only been for a short amount of time. And there's evidence of possible intergression. So that makes it interesting. 
Second of all, barred owl specimens are readily available and very numerous. In fact, to date, um, over 3,000 barred owls have been removed from the Western United States um, in order to study their impact on spotted owls and, and also to, to try and help spotted owls, which are really in big trouble. Um, and third, the genomics of both species are really important for informing management and policy because um, because managers and policymakers are trying to figure out how we can save the Northern Spotted Owl. And, and a lot of these, these options have to do with understanding, um, you know, how, how many, what the population subdivision is in, in within the, the Spotted Owls and also trying to understand what's happening with hybrids and with the invasion of barred owls. And so I've gotten really interested in, in this study system and a couple of questions that I'm gonna try and talk a little bit about today is um, first of all, this question about you know, why are Western barred owls different from Eastern barred owls? And um, in and, and what ways are they different? And so the first possibility that we wanna uh, entertain is that they may be hybrids, that, they, that barred owls, when they came to the Western United States and encountered spotted owls may have hybridized. And so there may be some genetic legacy of that early hybridization that's inherent in all of the populations of Western barred owls. Another possibility is that, is that as they moved into the Western United States, they, they went through a bottleneck and that this caused genetic drift in certain alleles to fix um, and that this caused differentiation from the populations in the East. And a third possibility is that there may actually be adaptation to the West and that you know, the, the bar dows that are arriving here may be adapting um, in ways separate from just genetic drift and hybridization. And so those are all things that we can look at um, using genetics. And so we got started um, in, gosh, almost a, almost a decade ago now, um, working on the Northern Spotted Owl Genome Project. And um, my graduate student, Zach Hanna, would really led the, led the push on this. We worked with Joe Derisi's lab at UCSF. And, uh, and Jeff Wall's lab has been very supportive of this work over the years, and he's been a great collaborator. And so, um, we were able to find a program bird, a captive bird um, in a rehab center that was brought into captivity around the time that the very first barred owls were spotted in Marin County. So we knew that this was 100% spotted out and it provided a really great reference to us. So we knew that this bird couldn't have any um, Eastern barred owl genes in it. Um, our, our first iteration of the NSO genome version 1.0 had about 90X coverage. It was mostly alumina paired end reads. Um, but we also had mate pair libraries, um, pretty big scaffolds, and really great Busco scores that were about 95%. Um, so it was, a, it was a very good genome, uh, especially for the time. And then as reference, we used an Eastern barred out genome, and we basically just sequenced one individual from Indiana at about 15 and a half um, X coverage. And all the reads were assembled to the, the Northern Spotted Owl reference genome. Okay. Um, and just to look at some of the sampling that we were able to use um, for this, uh, the, the barred owls, the barred owl points are shown here in the warmer colors and the spotted owls in the cooler colors. Um, and we had 11 spotted owls, um, some in from the farther north um, and some in the south. So they represent different times that they encountered barred owls. We had uh, five individuals from the Eastern United States of barred owls and then we had 33 different Western barred owls. And I'll, I will say too, that we kind of cherry picked those individuals that had weird looking phenotypes um, because we wanted to, to maximize the probability that we were picking up hybrids. So if hybrids were overrepresented in our data set, you know, we might be faulted for, for overpicking things that looked weird. We also had as reference two different birds that we believed were hybrids um, based on other field data that was available. So we had those as kind of reference. Um, we, we looked only at SNPs that were fixed and that were homozygote in our spotted owl reference and homozygous in our Eastern barred owl reference and that differed between the two. And so this gave us 5.8 million SNP nucleotides, um, which we could analyze. And, and then we sequenced all the other barred owls at low coverage and we were aiming for one X coverage in order to, to do this first pass. So here's a graph um, of, uh, of spotted owl ancestry versus coverage. Um, so the y-axis shows coverage here and the x-axis is spotted owl ancestry. So as expected, all of the uh, spotted owls are pinned against the right side of this graph um, because they were all 100% basically spotted owl um, SNPs at those sites. 
And then interestingly, the, um, the barred owls, all of the barred owls, except for the two known hybrids or suspected hybrids, were also pinned up against the other side. And so for reference here, the Eastern barred owls are in orange. And so that gives you the point at which all the other um, barred owls should be compared. And you can see that all of the Western barred owls um, actually lined up really closely there. And so basically what we learned is that all those weird looking habit, um, haplo, um, sorry, the, all those weird looking phenotypes of Western barred owls um, look as though they're genetically 100% barred out with no evidence of introgression. And we did have two individuals here in, in the center. Um, and these are our two hybrids. So one is, is exactly halfway between the, uh, the, east, the, the barred owls and the spotted owls. And we, we presume that this is a, an F1 hybrid. And then the other one looks like a, um, an F2 back cross hybrid crossed with the barred owl. Um, because it's somewhere halfway, roughly halfway between the F1 hybrid and, and barred owls. So that's interesting because it does tell us that, um, that the hybrid owls can interbreed, that they are fertile, um, and that they're producing offspring in the wild too. Um, now, we also were interested in, in finding evidence of, of integration that may have dated back much earlier when they first you know, came in contact, maybe as early as 100 years ago. And so we wanted to look more carefully for, for any, any particular regions um, that may be a low percentage of the genome, but that still are evidence of hybridization. And so to do this, we looked at 50 KB sliding windows and we just slid that window across the entire genome. Um, and again, even in that analysis, there were a very small proportion of outlier windows. And most of those, in fact, all of those could be explained. Um, by the, by the low coverage um, that we had. So it was, it, and overall those outlier regions in any individual was less than 1% of the total genome. And so um, we feel very confident that there's, that there's, that these individuals that have these weird phenotypes in the Western United States are actually 100% barred owls. So there's, there is evidence of hybridization in the data but no evidence of pervasive integration between um, barred owls and spotted owls in the Western United States. So we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this. And so um, we improved our, our genome. And so we have a genome version 2.0. Um, and for this analysis, we used 51 high coverage whole genome sequences from a variety of different, um, from a variety of different owls. Uh, for this analysis, the mean coverage per sample was about 31 um, X or 30 X coverage per genome. And we were able to look at all of the different SNPs that were variable. Um, they didn't need to be uh, homozygous in a, in a reference at either end. We were just able to look at all of them. And that afforded us 17 million um, biallelic SNPs that we could analyze that were on the 82 largest autosomal scaffolds um, of, the, of the owl. And if we look at our sampling, here's the map. Um, and you can see that uh, there were 25 barred owls pretty evenly split between uh, Eastern United States and Western United States. There were 11 spotted owls from two different subspecies. So we were able to include three California spotted owls in this. These are the ones that are shown in purple. And that's great because these ones um, would not have had contact yet with barred owls. Um, and we also had those two confirmed hybrids from the previous analysis, but also an additional 13 potential hybrids that were given to us based on their phenotype and suspected of, as, of being hybrids. So here is a graph of genome-wide SNP variation in a principal components axis with PC1 plotted against PC2. And um, here's how things break down. So in red here, in the right-hand side of the, of the graph, these are all spotted owls. And there is actually a little separation between California and Northern spotted owls here that I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, the green samples here are all Western barred owls. And you can see that there's a number of samples in between. Those are our hybrids. Um, several of these were, a couple of these, the ones in, in light blue were the known hybrids. So there's our our F1 and our back cross F2, but then you can see that some of those other suspected hybrids also fell into the middle there. And interestingly, our Eastern barred owls um, were in dark blue here and are up in the upper left and, and really separated from the Western barred owls. And so there's a couple take homes here. 
is one that, that we did detect the genetic separation between California spotted owl and Northern spotted owl. And you can blow that up or look at that in a separate PC and uh, principal components analysis and, and kind of nail that down a little bit better. Um, but we also got evidence of F1 and F2 hybrids, but no other evidence of introgression. So we didn't see any smear down here and we didn't find any additional in, uh, um, individuals or any regions in the genome that indicated you know, um, pervasive introgression between the two species. But really interestingly, there was significant separation between Eastern barred owls and Western barred owls. And now we want to begin asking, you know, like what's the explanation for that? Could it be that um, they went through a bottleneck on their way west or are there other explanations? So in order to look at the possibility of, of bottlenecks, we might, we might look at a coalescent analysis in a program like SMC++. And so for reference here, the leftmost one is a Northern spotted owl. And um, we have on the x-axis here time in the past. So it starts at about a thousand years ago and goes up to a million years ago. And then we're plotting population size. So you can see that the Northern spotted owl around 20, 25,000 years ago began to go through a bottleneck um, that peaked around 10,000 years ago um, when the, the last glacial maximum. But then you can see that the Northern spotted owl began to recover after the, the last glacial maximum and, and there was some population expansion. If we look at Eastern barred owls and Western barred owls, there's no evidence of any sort of population um, expansion or decline during the last glaciation. So they, they kind of held their own. There's a little bit of individual variation here. And probably some of that has to do with the different populations that Eastern barred owls were sampled from. But Western barred owls don't look like they went through any sort of bar, um, real bottleneck in the past. But remember these SMC um, analyses really aren't very powerful for looking at things more recent. And so we're really looking at, at things that you know, may have been a thousand years ago or older. So to look at things a little bit more recent, we can look at Tajima's D, which was negative in Northern Spotted Owl, which is, um, which is consistent with the expansion of the population post, uh, post the last glaciation. Um, and the Western Barred Owl shows a slightly um, positive Tajima's D which is consistent with a small bottleneck um, that may be more recent. So there's a possibility that that might have something to do with a, a recent bottleneck. Another thing that we can look at is, um, or another thing that's interesting is that if we look at the FST between Eastern barred owls and Western barred owls, the FST is very low, suggesting that there's really not that much um, distinction between those populations. And, and if we look at the, the um, nucleotide diversity pi between Eastern barred owl and Western barred owl, and within Western barred owl, you can see that those values are pretty similar and they're about an order of magnitude higher than the variation that you find in, in Northern spotted owl. So if they did go through a bottleneck, they certainly didn't lose very much genetic variation in doing so. So um, at least there's not much evidence of any sort of a genetic, a, a serious genetic bottleneck or genetic drift um, that may have resulted in that. But you know, if, there, if it was just genetic drift that separated them, then what we would expect is that the Western barred owls would kind of be a subset of the variation that we see in the Eastern barred owl. So it may be that we simply sampled the wrong populations in the Eastern barred owl, um, but there may be something else going on here. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is dive in a little bit deeper here. Um, and most of the other tools don't work very well for looking at very recent um, splits and so um, Jeff Wall and his team and Naoko Fujita did these really nice analyses where they looked at the generation of private alleles and the theoretical generation of private alleles after the separation of two populations. And they did some simulations to figure out um, what that should be. And then we were able to do an extrapolation on their simulation and using some estimated values for mutation rates and, and generation times, we could estimate the split time between Eastern and Western barred owls at around 7,000 years ago. That's a huge number compared to you know, what people had thought based on um, on the ground survey data, which would suggest that the population separated between eight or that the, yeah, that the populations really separated between 80 and 130 years ago. So that's, that's evidence that the populations were separated for a much longer period of time, or that maybe there was even some other refugia 
of, of barred owls that's separated from the eastern barred owls. Perhaps in Canada, we don't know where that could be, or, or in, and we hope to try and sample some of these other populations. But that's really interesting because it suggests that the western barred owls are very different genetically, not very different, but 7,000 years different from the eastern barred owls, and that it's not just this recent invasion that we're um, witnessing here. Um, Likewise, we were able to do the same kind of analysis, um, looking at the and trying to time the split of the northern spotted owl and the California spotted owl, and using exactly the same tools and techniques, we estimate the divergence between these two subspecies of spotted owl at around 14,000 years ago, which again aligns very nicely um, with the with the rebounding after the um, and population expansion after the last uh, glacial maximum. Um, there's one other thing that I won't go into because I don't think we really have that much time, but there is some evidence of asymmetry in, in the parentage of, of hybrids. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to look at um, because we had the whole genomes, we could look at the W chromosome and mitochondrial DNA to try and figure out whether um, it's, it's typically barred owls versus spotted owls that are the mothers of the, of the hybrids. And what we found is that there's evidence of both in the data set. Um, so it doesn't look like they're limited to one kind of pairing. Um, so in summary, we confirmed that hybridization and backcrossing does occur between the two species, but we found that there was no evidence of widespread admixture between barred and spotted owls in Western North America. And that the distinctive plumage that we find in Western barred owls does not appear to be the result of hybridization with spotted owls and probably not um, due to a population bottleneck. So it may be, it may be, um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the cause of that might be. Um, unlike previous studies reporting asymmetries in the species specific genders of the parents of F1 hybrids, we didn't observe um, significant asymmetry. But interestingly, the Western barred owl genetic variation is not simply a subset of the genetic variation in Eastern barred owl, suggesting that the two groups may have been genetically isolated for longer, even thousands of years uh, than the previously suspected 80 to 130 years. And similarly, we found evidence of substantial genetic differentiation between the two spotted owl subspecies. Um, and finally, the, you know, the analyses um, have a lot of information about the northern spotted owls and their population history, as well as the California spotted owl. And with the California Conservation Genomics Program, we're hoping to sample a lot more spotted owls um, of all three subspecies to try and understand what's going on. And we're hoping that some of that information will be helpful in, in trying to protect um, the spotted owls, which are in, in pretty big trouble throughout their range. So I'd like to thank all the collaborators, especially Zach Hanna, who did a lot of this work in the lab, um, Jeff Wall, who's, who's, who is a great collaborator at UCSF and, and helped spearhead a lot of the, the genetics as well as a lot of the analysis. Um, Naoko did a lot of the analysis as well. And then the other folks contributed to a lot of the field work um, a lot of the specimen prep and, and a lot of the design of the experiment. So thanks to everybody. Um, thanks for the invitation to uh, speak here today, Athena. I, I really appreciate it. Um, as a new curator, I am um, just beginning my lab um, and I'm definitely on the precipice of, of uh, generating much more extensive uh, genomic resources, um, but I'm on the precipice. <laughs> so what I'm gonna share with you today is um, more of a backdrop or kind of setting the stage for some of the more genomics heavy uh, work that I would like to do in the future. So um, before I start talking specifically about Castilea, I want to kind of introduce my research uh, generally. So I am a plant systematist and um, systematics means a lot of different things to different people, um, but I like to think of it in the context of um, this illustration from a Stussy paper in the late 70s. So uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very interested in taxonomy and the classification process. And uh, I am interested in, in helping to curate our classification system. I also uh, am interested in inferring evolutionary relationships among the organisms that I work on. Uh, so studying their phylogenetic history. And then uh, using that information, of course, to ask um, bigger, cooler questions about um, processes of evolution that um, generate the diversity that I'm observing and describing. Uh, as a um, plant systematist, of course, all of um, 
my questions uh, revolve around plants. And in terms of evolutionary processes, um, my, my greatest interest lies in understanding uh, the earliest stages of the speciation process, um, trying to characterize and describe this. And of course I do this in plants and very specifically with a group of plants that are um, very charismatic, um, very beautiful and blooming right now. Um, and these uh, are the genus Castilea, um, more commonly known as the paintbrushes. So if you've ever been uh, out West, you've definitely seen paintbrushes. Um, they're often in these really um, beautiful, epic places with um, lovely wildflowers in the foreground and, and inspirational mountains in the, in the distance. Um, but Cal uh, Castilea comes in lots of different colors and forms and shapes um, as shown in some of these pictures. Um, so there are about uh, 200 named species of Castilea and uh, Castilea are all what we call hemiparasites. So uh, they are capable of photosynthesis, but they also connect to um, plants, their hosts, and parasitize these plants, um, stealing water and photosynthates. Uh, these 200 species are very widely distributed across the Americas, um, but their greatest diversity occurs in North America, specifically Western North America, and we have the largest number of species here in, in the California floristic province. Um, this is also a group that is notoriously taxonomically challenging. Um, many botanists have commented on the difficulty in identifying species in Castilea, which has led to some really funny um, quips. So here, uh, Rickett says that the genus Castilea is one of those that make botanists wish they had embraced some easy branch of science, such as theoretical physics. Um, it's supposed to make you laugh, um, but it's no joke. Uh, Castilea species are pretty difficult to tell apart. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, first of all, there's a lot of um, continuous morphological characters across species boundaries. On top of that, um, there is a lot of widespread geographic and ecological overlap of named species. There are plenty of endemic species, including here in California, but almost all of these endemics exist in, the, in close proximity to other species of Castilea. And when these species are in close proximity, we have building evidence that there's a lot of gene flow that happens across species boundaries. On top of that, we know that um, Castilea are uh, widely polyploids and the, the levels of polyploidy are variable both within species and across species. And there's evidence that um, polyploidy can be uh, autopolyploidy as well as allopolyploidy. And we think that hybridization uh, is quite common. Finally, this is a pretty young group. So the common ancestor of Castilea is somewhere between four and six million years old. Um, but probably the bulk of the species diversi diversity has really been generated in the last several hundred thousand years. So um, all of this together suggests that this is a recent and rapid radiation. So right now, uh, taxonomy is largely organized around morphology. So here I have kind of a general breakdown of your typical Castilea. So you've got the, the main plant there on the left side of the screen. At the top of the stems are inflorescences composed of many flowers. If you peel off one of those flowers and dissect it into its component pieces, um, you'll see the bracts, calyx, and corolla. And it's really the calyx and the corolla uh, where many of the diagnostic features of species uh, occur. And these are also the parts of the flower that have allowed us to um, kind of group these named species into major morphotypes. So these are some stylized drawings of these major morphotypes based on the calyx and the corolla. Those top three images are um, morphotypes that have really short beaks. Uh, they are large, they are likely insect pollinated and we have both annual and perennial members of, of these morphotypes. Um, below the dotted line is the long beaked um, morphotype. Um, these are probably pollinated by hummingbirds or butterflies and moths. Um, this group is almost entirely perennial, although there are a couple of annual members. Uh, there are a number of species that belong to each of these morphotypes. And in some cases, we've further um, grouped uh, species that have more cohesive morphologies into 
um, species alliances or morphological alliances. So um, some of the um, kind of first people that were working in Castilea came up with two main hypotheses about the evolutionary relationships in Castilea, um, kind of built around uh, the annual or perennial habit and these major morphotypes. Um, first of all, uh, the, they kind of assumed that the annual habit was derived from a perennial background. And this is a commonly held um, hypothesis or uh, a hypothesis that's adhered to uh, pretty commonly by botanists. We think that annuals are often a good bet hedging strategy for lineages that exist in really extreme environments. Um, another hypothesis about relationships suggested that these morphotypes were uh, independent lineages. Some early molecular phylogenetic work um, kind of blew both of these hypotheses out of the water. Um, consistently recovered evidence that perennials were derived from an annual background, which was pretty unusual. Um, and they were also finding that uh, morphotypes were pretty, pretty widely scattered uh, across the entire genus. So when I started, oh, I'm sorry, and of course that work was, um, you know, based on pretty uh, sparse sampling and just a few molecular loci. So when I started working in Castilea during my PhD, I was part of some big efforts to develop um, a larger, more expanded uh, molecular data set. <clears throat> so um, we developed um, Castilea specific primers from both the chloroplast and the nuclear genome. And using a combination of different uh, high throughput sequencing techniques, um, we sequenced um, more than 500 individuals, probably closer to almost 900 individuals um, that represented the bulk of the named species in Castilea. And then we use this information to try to understand the evolutionary history of the chloroplast genome and the nuclear genome, and then um, with the ultimate goal of moving towards a species stream. So uh, our chloroplast phylogeny is uh, currently composed of uh, around 526 tips. Uh, we have a lot of um, support for the backbone, the, the deep nodes in this topology, um, but varying levels of support within clades. Uh, one of the first patterns that we noticed when we were kind of looking at this in detail is that there's a large geographic signal uh, to this uh, topology. So we have a general clade that's composed of Pacific Northwest, Rocky Mountain, Northern California, and Sierra species. Another uh, clade composed of Mexican, Intermountain, and Great Basin species. We have a small clade of our, our few uh, South American species, and another clade composed of uh, Southern California species. And, and these geographic clades make a lot of geographic sense when we think about some of the major ecoregions in North America. So this is a, a broad pattern, but you know the Pacific Northwest, Rocky Mountain, Northern California, Sierra clade is a contiguous region. Uh, the Mexican Intermountain um, and Great Basin species are another. The Southern California group is, is unique. And here we don't have the, the South American um, ecoregion colored, but uh, you can think of that white clade as another um, or that white part on the map as corresponding to our South American clade. When we examine um, the signal of perennials and annuals, um, we continue to recover this, this evidence of perennials derived from an annual background. So here the annuals are in red and the perennials in, are in green. And um, we're seeing this repeated in each of these geographic clades. Uh, we're also finding that widespread taxa are largely uh, polyphyletic. So uh, here is an example with Castilea cusicii, um, where our samples are colored in red. And this is a widespread species in the Pacific Northwest. And you can see multiple tips scattered across that entire clade um, where this species occurs. Um, and even more widespread species, Castilea miniata, which occurs all across North America, is similarly placed in multiple geographic clades corresponding to the location of those samples. It's hard to see, but we've got a, a Miniata sample here in the Inner Mountain um, clade, and again here in the Southern California clade. When we look at these um, morphotypes, we see that these are 
widely scattered across the entire phylogeny. And then when we reduce this down to um, the uh, morphological alliances within these major morphotypes, we see this continuously scattered um, uh, pattern. Now switching gears to um, our preliminary nuclear data set, um, I say preliminary because uh, you know, we designed primers for 48 loci, um, but given the high, well, we, uh, we quickly understood that um, many of our loci suffered from issues of, of paralogy, and we had a hard time um, uh, discerning which copies go with what. So we took our data set and, and found those loci that appeared to be composed of largely orthologous copies, and we built a species tree using just these. So this is um, a data set that's composed of almost 300 accessions representing about 76 species and, and using SVD quartets to infer a species tree. Uh, we continue to find our, um, uh, our geographic clades uh, with this data. We also continue to recover perennials derived from an annual background. Here it's in the context of the entire genus rather than in the context of these geographic clades. And we also find that mor morphotypes are variously scattered. We're also finding evidence of these curious sister pair relationships that are difficult for us to explain, except for the fact that they occur in close geographic proximity. So a great example is Cremosa and Cyneria, which I have boxed here. Um, these flowers or these species are very different from one another and they have very different morphotypes. So they probably have very different pollinators and yet they are recovered as sisters. And we see this multiple times in this species tree. So to take kind of like, um, or to make a broad stroke interpretation of, of these data so far, um, we can say a couple of things. So first of all, I think there's a good amount of evidence for something called chloroplast capture that probably happens um, at, at the deeper nodes in the tree and in a geographic context. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, chloroplast capture, or sorry, I wanted to make this point, um, we can think of Castilea as kind of a chloroplast melting pot. These geographic clades are these chloroplast melting pots. pots. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, chloroplast capture, this is the idea where um, you have the pollen of one species, species A, and the egg of another species B that come together to create um, a hybrid that has an intermediate morph. And that hybrid crosses back to uh, one of the species to create uh, a progeny that um, looks like parental species A, but has the chloroplast signal of uh, parental species B. And so I think this is, goes a long way towards explaining some of these um, broad scale geographic patterns from the chloroplast genome. In terms of the nuclear genome, what we're seeing I think is evidence likely of contemporary gene flow. And so when we combine all of this together, it seems as though there have been these cyclical kind of um, divergence and convergence of populations. Uh, whenever they come in contact, they, um, they share genes. And so we're picking up a lot of these signals with our different types of data. So in terms of developing genomic resources, um, I have a couple of plans. So um, I'm gonna continue to work with the data that we've already generated um, in, in Castilea, um, namely manually sorting orthologs and paralogs. Um, but there's at this, at this point, we have kind of an unknown amount of uh, phylogenetic utility of these particular loci. And so with collaborators, I'm also um, exploring the utility of universal primer sets that take advantage of um, coding sequences to access variation on either side of that coding area. So here I'm specifically thinking about um, the angiosperm 353 bakes. I'm also going to be, um, and I'm already in the process of, of sequencing and phasing a, di a diploid genome. And of course this genome is going to help um, uh, sort out issues of, or sit out, sort out questions associated with polyploidy, 
but the genome is also going to um, provide a framework for me to really um, closely uh, examine um, gene flow when species are in our proximal. So I'm, I'm really excited about um, diving into um, some of that work. But from a more zoomed out perspective, um, I think, uh, you know, all of this information really also warrants asking the question, just how good are our species and how useful is it to start an endeavor such as this with species that might be poorly understood, at least at this point. And as just a really quick example of what I'm talking about, um, this is I have done some careful morphological studies of um, various species of Castilea, um, one of which is including the Pylosis species complex. So this is just a couple of the players in the complex and um, careful delimitation in this group using just morphological data has suggested that um, the distinction between these entities is uh, limited. Um, preliminary analyses of environmental and molecular data um, suggest different ways to group these entities into species. So this really underscores, um, I think, the fact that, you know, some of our understanding of species is kind of shaky. <laughs> we need to be um, carefully delimiting species in this group, and we, we need to be using multiple sources of evidence to do that. Uh, it also kind of um, makes me think about like the traditional approach to systematics, which has largely been um, starting from species to infer a phylogeny and then using that phylogeny to infer evolutionary processes, thinking of kind of like the tip backward approach um, to understanding this. Um, but really I need to be doing both directions at once using um, an understanding of evolutionary processes namely polyploidy, hybridization, and gene flow to understand, understand something about the phylogeny that will help to inform information about the species. And really, this is going to be um, a cyclical process, um, a very iterative process, uh, which is another reason why I really like that first illustration that I showed you, um, thinking about this entire process as a circle where there's no real beginning and end. And really, it's just a constant kind of check in from all these different components. As the very last point that I wanted to make, um, another thing that uh, I recognize, at least in my head, I've had to, to get around is that expecting um, speciation uh, to be a strictly bifurcating process that we can infer um, and, and visualize in a bifurcating manner um, could be hampering us, uh, particularly in cases like Castilea. Instead, we need to be thinking along the lines of a network. Uh, you know, lineages are diverging from one another and then they're converging again, and then they're diverging perhaps in a slightly different way and converging again, creating this kind of like gray zone mass um, that is the speciation process. And I think something like the braided channels of a riverbed is a, a really nice way to, to illustrate that. Um, so this is how I'm thinking of Castilea uh, as a braided river channel. So um, I want to acknowledge that all of this work was initiated uh, when I was a, a PhD in the tank lab at the University of Idaho. So um, thanks for um, all of that support and um, my collaborations there. Um, but I'm also excited to acknowledge the Cal Academy where I'm again starting my own lab. Um, and I guess I'll stop there and uh, take any questions. <laughs>